This is part two of the video lecture, Introduction to Christian Ethics. This video lecture is for the course, Christian Worldview and Biblical Decision-Making at the East Asia School of Theology. So in the first part of this video lecture, we looked at what ethics is. We also looked at some different types of ethics, and then we looked at some of the distinguishing features of Christian ethics. Now, in this second part of the video lecture, we are going to look at why it is difficult to think and live ethically in today's world. There are some reasons why it is difficult to think and live ethically in today's world. And so let's look at what these reasons are. One reason why it is difficult to think and act in today's world is because of the corruption of human sin. We looked, we looked at this when we looked at Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. The fact of the matter is that sin draws us away from clear thinking and a desire for righteousness in such a way that we become unable to see God's desired pathway for our lives. The ironic tragedy of sin is that it produces in us an insatiable desire for undesirable things and pursuit, clouding our ability to see and embrace God's best for our lives. Another reason why um, it is difficult to think and act ethically in today's world is because of the corruption of the world. First John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17 talk about this. This may sound like an abstraction of sort, but it ultimately manifests itself in world in the world system that are most clearly manifest in economic, political, religious, and other ways. Sin also makes itself known through widespread ungodly ideologies and pursuit. As 1 John 2, 16 to 17 puts it, the world system tries to draw people into giving themselves to the fading and impermanent pursuits of passion, pleasure, and position rather than the enduring and permanent pleasures of intimately knowing and serving the one true eternal God. Now, I just want to add one quick note here. In this slide, I have a picture of a city. Now, I, I am not trying to suggest that cities are evil places, but I am trying to say that cities are places where sinful people tend to gather in large numbers. And so this is why uh, we find the corruption of the world in cities, not because cities are sinful in and of themselves, but because large numbers of humans sinful humans live in cities. We also have the corruption of the devil, which is talked about in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, as well as 2 Corinthians 11, 3. Satan attempts to discourage us, deceive us, tempt us, and draw us away from living in the joyful simplicity and freedom of ethical Christian living that stems from an intimate and growing relationship with and dependence upon the God of love and righteousness. So this is another reason why it is difficult to think and live ethically in today's world. 
Then there is the problem of complexity. Some contemporary ethical issues are not directly addressed in scripture. Human cloning and thermonuclear war, for example, are nowhere directly addressed in the pages of scripture. This does not mean the scriptures have nothing to say about these and dozens of other contemporary issues. It simply means that we cannot simply appeal to certain passages of scripture directly about these issues. Instead, we are challenged to examine such dilemmas in the light of scripture as a whole, and then attempt to properly apply more general principles with the help of several other aspects that are part of any good theological methodology. Another reason why it's difficult to think and live ethically in today's world is that in some ethical situations, there appear to be competing ethical values. Note here that this is often a question of value ranking in ethical decision making. That is to say, ethical decisions are often not simple because they involve choosing one good ethical value over another good ethical value. For example, Dutch Christian Corrie ten Boom chose to lie to German authorities during World War II when asked whether or not she was harboring Jews in her home because she believed that in this extreme and difficult situation, the value of human life, in this case persecuted Jews, trumped and superseded the value of truth-telling to people who were wicked and unjust. So sometimes there are, we face situations where we face um, two or more ethical values that are equally good, but they may be in conflict. And so then we have to choose one ethical value over another ethical value. Likewise, in some ethical situations, there appear to be competing ethical responsibilities. A person may be torn and uncertain when attempting to decide where his or her ultimate loyalties lie and what this looks like in real life regarding such things as responsibilities to parents, spouses and children versus work, government, and other types of institutions. So here in this slide, we have a visual representation of the conflicting ethical responsibilities that many women today have. You know, the ethical responsibility to care for their children, but also an ethical responsibility to do, to do their best at work. Another reason why it is difficult to think and act ethically in today's world is that our human finiteness limits our ability to know all the relevant factors in making the right ethical decision especially in large and complex systems. Lacking omniscience means that sometimes we have to make critical life decisions when we do not have all the facts or information we would really like to have. In these instances, we do the best we can with the limited resources that we have and we trust that God will guide us and correct, correct us as we go along. Um, my pastor once put it this way, 
It's as if we're playing checkers while God playing 12 dimensional chess. And this is this, this um, metaphor illustrates how finite our understanding is compared to how infinite God's understanding is. But recognizing the complexity of moral decision does not eliminate the reality that sometimes we are challenged to be moral and do the right thing because we succumb to the temptations of the evil one, because we are still fighting with a sin nature in the inner being of our person, and because we live within communities and a world that is still tainted and marred by sin. Another aspect we need to understand is that there is always a concrete cultural component that both complicates as well as provides important resources for ethical living. This is why even for Christians, ethical living may not look exactly the same in every time and place. This fact does not make ethical living relative in the postmodern sense of that term, but it does recognize that all genuine ethical living is contextual and situated. As a result, ethical Christian living requires more than a mere knowledge of the Bible, as important as that is. It also requires wisdom and knowledge, cultural understanding and insight, creativity and imagination, so that the way in which we as Christians live out our ethical principles will be both grounded in the reality and truth of God and his word, as well as relevant to the concrete situation in which we find ourselves a part of. One example that comes to mind in this regard is the manner, matter of drinking alcohol. In some contexts, drinking alcohol, not merely getting drunk, is unwise and borders on wrong. At the same time, getting drunk can actually be an act of kindness in some rare situation. See, for example, Proverbs 31.6. In this context, it is an act of compassion, not an act of godless folly or licentious dissipation. We also need to remember the perennial promise, power, and presence of God and his word in pursuing the ethical life. Hebrews 4.12 and Hebrews 13.5 talks about this reality. Despite the problems and challenges of ethical living in the often complex and ambiguous age we find ourselves faced with, the fact is that God is actively present with us today and every day in our ethical pursuits. In addition, his holy word is living and active in the world today. This gives us great hope, as well as a certain level of confident humility as we seek to pursue the ethical enterprise out of a genuine desire to know, please, and honor God, bringing him the glory he so eminently deserves. As Hollinger notes in Choosing the Good, it is this same God who becomes the ground, norm, and power for ethical living. We also have the reality that God is the ground of ethics. And 1 John 4, 7 through 8 speaks about this. Essentially, it is God's goodness in his very being that emanates out to all of his creation 
and is expressed in his own self-disclosure, especially through scripture and Jesus Christ and the incarnate word. Without God's being at the source of our ethical understanding, we would only have one another's opinions and nothing more to determine and judge between competing ethical vision of the truly good life. As an example, 1 John 4, 7 through 8 notes that our love for one another is not grounded in ourselves, but in God, whose very nature and essence is love. All of this highlights the critical importance of how we view God. If ethics are grounded in the being and life of God, then our view of him will have a profound impact on our view of morality. For example, if we see God as cold and distant, an arbitrary God who commands for no other reason then he is God, and he has the right to do so, then we will tend to obey out of a sense of sheer duty and perhaps even fear. But we are unlikely to obey God because we see the goodness of his command as prohibitions and the requirements which are a means to our, for our well-being to protect and provide for us. So we see how our picture of God deeply influences our attitude towards ethical living. We also need to remember that God is the norm of ethics. And Matthew 5, 6, 5, 6 and 7 describe what this ethical norm is. While God's being is the ground of ethics, his self-revelation also becomes the necessary source of ethical norms. Without such revelation, we would have a hard time discerning what it is that God actually expects of us as his creatures. Matthew 5 through 7 is traditionally called the Sermon on the Mount and provide just one example of many such passages in the Bible which provide normative ethical injunctions for people to follow. It constitutes some of the most profound moral teaching the world has ever known, and much of it is clearly intended to be transculturally and transtemporally normative. Of course, herein also lies a great danger. Detaching the Christian norm from the nature and being of the norm giver, God. Much of the history of ethics, even within the church, has struggled with this tendency to make ethics an independent subject that requires no reference to God as a moral being as it to be its source and ground, cut loose from its moorings, ethics inevitably drifts into relativistic and other kinds of unethical waters. Keep in mind as well that ethics are not merely Christocentrically aligned, as important as the incarnate Jesus might be, they must also be distinctly Trinitarian in nature and incorporate God as being God in his entire being as Father, Son, and Spirit. In Hollinger's helpful words, Christian ethics must embody Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The givenness of created realities the divine commands of Yahweh at Sinai, the life and teachings of Jesus, the discernment of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church must all be operative 
if we are to embody a Trinitarian ethic in which, with, in which God is the norm. But clearly, Jesus, as the very image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, Colossians 1.15, is a concrete and vital norm for Christian action and character. He is the clearest expression in human history of what it means to be good and the most explicit revelation of God's glory, Hebrews 1, 2, and 3, and fullness, Colossians 1, 19. So let, we also have God as the power for ethics. And John 15 talks about how God is the power for ethics. So let's take a few moments to consider this quote from Dennis Hollinger. He writes, many people give cognitive assent to doing the good, but find both internal and external restraint in actually accomplishing it. Thus, empowerment is clearly an issue to consider in Christian ethics, though it has not been a mainstay in much of the discipline. While humans have certain native capacities for achieving virtue and moral actions, our fallen nature turns us away from the good in both our understanding and our behavior. Biblically speaking, there are two main sources of power for ethical living, God's grace and God's presence in our lives, most notably through his, the Holy Spirit. John 15, 5 says that apart from Christ, we can do nothing. We are powerless to be truly good and Christ-like apart from dependence on, abiding in, Christ, and being filled with God's Holy Spirit. See Ephesians 5.18 and following. Unfortunately, the Holy Spirit has been badly neglected in Christian ethics in the last few hundred years, and has clearly, and this has clearly hurt the church's understanding of the ethical life. This lack of emphasis on the necessity of the Holy Spirit's power in Christian ethical living is at least partly due to what might be called the rationalization of Christianity in the post-Enlightenment era, where reason became the primary, if not exclusive, concern in most intellectual discussions on such matters as morality. It also has to do with the tendency to let non-Christian and more philosophical ethics set the agenda for all major ethical discourse. But as Christian philosopher Alvin Plantinga makes so clear in his article on the agenda for Christian philosophers, why should we let secular ethics set the parameters for distinctly Christian ethical discourse? As important as it is for us to, to interact with other ethical perspectives, it is high time for Christians to put in some serious ethic efforts to talk about ethics in truly Christian ways. The concern for God's role in ethical living and the issues that human nature af after the fall add into the equation must not be neglected or ignored by Christians in the name of academic respectability or comprehensibility to those outside the Christian community. To do so is to do our own family a grave disservice 
and to dishonor God as well. Christian ethics involves so much more than discerning right from wrong. And even this process requires the spirit's wisdom to know how to translate the relevant ancient ethical norms into contemporary settings and situations. Of course, it also involves the doing of the right and the righting of the wrong, alongside of becoming like the one in whose image we have been created. But to do any of this with a pure heart and right motives to any degree of sustained success must involve the grace and presence of God as it is given to us through Christ's salvation, the indwelling Holy Spirit, and the awesome power of his living and active, inspired holy word. See Hebrews 4.12. In this sense, then, Hollinger is spot on when he states that on page 69, that Christian ethics is not a natural enterprise. So let me close by reading Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 25. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, faction, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And so I want to encourage you to think on this passage. So what we've done in this video lecture is we've looked at what ethics is, We've looked at some different types of ethics. We've considered, um, we've also considered why ethics is difficult to live and practice in our world today. So please be sure to read your reading assignment for this lesson. And in class, we will discuss your reading assignment, and this video lecture. So I look forward to seeing you in class.